Why did a group of mining heavy hitters join West Red Lake Gold Mines? Shane Williams is president and CEO. Shane, welcome to Kitco. Great to be on with uh, Shane, um, I'd like to talk about the history of the project in a minute, but maybe first you can talk about uh, the potential of West Red Lake gold mines. What type of operation are you envisioning and what's the production going to be? Yeah, a little bit of context, Mike, to the, to the story, really. Um, you know, obviously, Frank is our major shareholder and Frank and ourselves got together about a year ago. And Frank's a big gold macro bull and sees the setup over the next number of years. And so obviously we looked at something that was near charm production, get into production very quickly and ride that goal run as, as is happening at the moment. So yeah, so the project came on and it has about a production target of around 80 to 100,000 ounces a year and it's near charm production. We're hoping to be in production around 2025, end of 25. So those sort of metrics and given the price, we got the project for really create that opportunity to get near term production and build upon that. So that's kind of what interests everybody on the story, really. Let's talk about the history. Uh, the uh, West Ray Gold Mines, that uh, comes from uh, Pure Gold, uh, which uh, ran into credit or difficulty. Uh, what was the story there and what are you going to be doing differently? Yeah, the history is a little bit, you know, at a time as... Some of your viewers will remember Pure Gold was a darling of the stock market here in, in Canada in particular. It ran very high. It was a, it was a big story. It had a lot of high-grade ounces. And unfortunately, look, a couple of things hit them. With it. They took on a lot of debt. It was a big debt problem. They took on a debt, large amount of debt with had some strong covenants around it. We also believe that they were setting the company up for a sale, you know, a long-term sale. There was a lot of M&A going on. Around Red Lake in particular, if you remember, Evolution was buying the new, the new, new, uh, the Gold Corp assets. Great Bear was going well. So there was a lot of that m &A strategy. So we believe they were setting the project up for sort of an m &A transaction, which they didn't really focus on from an operational point of view or to build a gold mining company. So, you know, hence we brought in a team, obviously with the backing of Frank and more project builders, project developers and helping to set the company up for more of a long-term growth story. Um, they also had COVID. Unfortunately, like COVID hit them in the middle of all that ramp up. And so that had its own effects on all gold mining companies, not just developers. But it's particularly difficult as you're doing a development ramp up story with people, spare parts, equipment. So a lot of those headwinds hit them at the, at, at the wrong time as they were ramping up, really. Now now, you mentioned before, you do have uh, mine builders on this team right now. So uh, you mentioned uh, Frank, uh, of course, a uh, business and mining legend in, uh, the, um, in, um, in the space uh, with a significant portion. I believe he has 15% of the company. But um, I also see uh, Tony McCooch uh, on your uh, board of directors as well as Duncan Middlemas and yourself. Yeah, so really, uh, Frank is just over a 12, an 11% shareholder. And so really the, the plan was this, was to build a, a next major gold mining company in Canada. Look, the long-term vision is to build, build upon what we have got and build into a company builder, basically, a large gold mining company. And so we set the company up that way, obviously the backing with Frank, building a board. You know, a lot of these junior companies start up and they have a board and the board have to scale up. But we wanted to come in strong to show the technical capabilities of the team, the leadership and the mentorship with a board. So hence we brought on Tony, who a lot of the viewers will know has been very successful with Kirkton Lake, Duncan obviously with Westo. I think that gives a lot of credibility to the new story, the revised story as we go forward. And myself, I'm a, I'm a project developer, project builder, worked with El Dorado Gold, Skeena Resources. So a history of building projects with a technical focus. So that was kind of the, the new story, in a sense, we really want to reset. We're here to build a company, build a project, and, and build a large company as we go forward over the next number of years. Uh, step back and talk about uh, the Red Lake region itself, uh, Shane. Um, it's a significant uh, jurisdiction for mining in Canada, and, and also you have a lot of mines around you. Yeah, look, one of the reasons we also picked Red Lake and areas, you know, in Canada now, a lot of places have become flavor of the month. Uh, the Golden Triangle, as an example, in BC, you know, a lot of developers there, a lot of a lot of areas, you know, some companies are in the Yukon now. Yukon is very popular. We 
we always felt that Red Lake has been overlooked a little bit. You know, it has a historical over 40 million ounces of high-grade gold has been produced in Red Lake over the history. So it's a very famous Canadian gold mining story. And, you know, there's not a lot of developers around there. There was not. Great Bear had a great run in that region, as some of your viewers will know. Obviously, they've been bought by Kinross. The original gold corp mines are there from our, our own now by evolution. So there's no really developer in that region. So if people want to play an up-and-coming, growing story, there was nobody there. Great Bear had a great run. And so we're hoping to be the next story. So that's why we try to pick Red Lake. Good area, good good potential for high-grade gold. But also, if you're growing and developing that area, you get investors back interested in the Red Lake region. So that's part of the story. I don't have to talk about these uh, markets with you, Shane. I know that you've been paying attention. Uh, we've had uh, the run-up in uh, gold prices, several all-time highs. Um, it just looks, uh, we're having this uh, conversation on April 4th. Uh, we see about a uh, 16% rise in uh, the senior gold miners as, as per the GDX over the last per month. Uh, you know, and we're starting to see that uh, trickle down uh, to the juniors as well, too. But um, maybe just talk about, um, uh, we had a conversation yesterday with Peter Groskoff, and uh, he speculated that uh, gold miners may have been held back uh, by uh, concerns about costs. You are developing a mine right now. Um, are costs an issue with uh, getting a mine out? Yeah, today, as you probably know, Peter probably knows it because he's in the financing of it. A lot of issues with costs over the last number of years, inflation, um, and the challenges associated with that, getting people, getting spare parts, getting access. That's pretty much why we targeted yeah. a kind of a near-term production story. You know, we, where most of the infrastructure is already in place in our project. It was in commercial production. All the major capex has been done. There's been three hundred and fifty million dollars spent on this project. So again, we targeted this so that a lot of those headwinds that miners are facing, we're kind of over that hump in a sense. We've kind of done the pure gold team have done the heavy lifting, have have built the infrastructure and, and put the permits in place. So if you look at permitting risk associated with mining or a cost inflation risk, what are those risks? We've kind of ticked the boxes. So we're very strategic in picking an asset that was in near-term production and had most of the capex. So as we go forward, we have very little capex to spend to get this back into production. That's kind of one of the reasons we targeted this area. Uh, we're talking, what about uh, human talent? Uh, it's something that we've seen that's been coming up more and more in the industry as well. So uh, Mark Bristow uh, at uh, Barrick, as well as Jorge Gones at uh, Fortuna uh, Silver Mines highlighted that uh, some of this cost inflation just comes from the fact that you know, skilled mining people, uh, they're rare and they're hard to find. Yeah, look, the industry has suffered a little bit of that uh, um, over the last number of years in reality. And it's, it's the cyclical nature of the business. You know, 10, 10 years ago, it was booming. Then it went down a little bit. You know, people get into the industry, get back out. It's hard to get young people in the industry. And particularly to build a mine today, um, like it takes somewhere between 10, 10 years nearly to get a good mine into production. And build a company takes even longer. And having a supply of people is a challenge. And, you know, again, the, the correct way is to have, we built our team around young executives who are all there for the long term to build a company. And if you can mirror that with senior executives, with the likes of Tony, Duncan, you know, you get a good blend of the old, the old experienced with the young, enthusiastic engi engineers people. And that's a good blend we find of uh, to build a company because it's hard work now, you know, to find the people with the right skills who built mines, operated mines. It's, it's a tough one for sure. Yeah. Uh, I had a question uh, stepping back, uh, but I just want to talk about um, uh, innovation that you're seeing in uh, milling and seeing within uh, operations, just given your breadth of experience. We hear a lot about uh, mines. Uh, they're doing things in regarding uh, automation. They're doing things with electrification. They're doing something with renewables. Uh, when you're tracking these things and as you're developing these CapEx projects out, are you seeing anything that's meaningful in the space right now, Shane? Yeah, we are. We are seeing a lot of issues, um, particularly on the technology of the service providers, like the, you know the companies who supply drilling equipment and the uh, uh, machines themselves. They're getting a lot more automated. So that's really been a game changer for the industry. Um, also because of lack of people, you know, the more and more automation is coming into the role of the jobs itself, 
And you're also getting electrification. There's a lot of big mines in Canada who are actually very electrified underground using the equipment. And it's more of a it's more of a necessity, back to your other point on lack of people and lack of young people in the industry. You know, the industry needs to innovate to bring those in so that they can continue. You know, there's a there's a lot of uh, baby boomers, as we say, who retire over the next 10 or 15 years. And they're the heart and soul of the mining industry for the last 20 years. And so we need to be replacing those people. And technology is definitely a way of doing that. Definitely a way and a big part of that as we go forward. Lastly, uh, back to uh, West Drake Goldmine. Um, what are going to be the milestones over the next 12 months, Shane? Yeah, look, we have some really exciting milestones coming up. We've just done a financing there, quite a, a, a non-dilutive financing, which provides us a, a good bit of money in our, in our treasury. We are st- adding more drills underground at the moment. We are starting to drill some really exciting areas of the ore body that never really were drilled prior to this. So we're getting underground and doing that. We're also kicking off a pre-feasibility study that we're doing and planning to launch, like relaunch and restart back in the middle of to the end of 25. So really exciting growth story as we're moving forward. Um, and, and if we're doing that in that in the setup as in gold prices rising, it could be a very exciting story for like next year. Shane, thanks for talking with Keiko. Excellent. Thank you very much. My name is Michael McRae. You're watching Keiko Mining.